We'll be looking at a, a couple of passages in particular uh, in Numbers 3 and, and Numbers 4. Uh, we've been uh, looking in the uh, book of Numbers about uh, the war that God's people are called to and, and they're about to, uh, they need to head into the promised land and take hold of the inheritance for them. And, and today we see that as the, the war for souls and, and we're called to do that and exercise the um, sword of the Spirit in the people's lives, that is the gospel. And as we talk about the gospel, people are one and take that inheritance uh, to themselves. And so as we look here at this passage uh, dealing with uh, priests and Levites, uh, we look at what Jesus was talking about when he said, all scripture, Moses, the law, and the prophets all speak of me. Um, And so we look at this and say, how does this speak of Jesus and his church today and the gospel? And so that's what we're looking at this morning. We'll start in Numbers chapter 3, uh, verse 5. This is God's word, eternally true. The Lord said to Moses, uh, Bring the tribe of Levi and present them to Aaron the priest to assist him. They are to perform duties for him and for the whole community at the tent of meeting by doing the work of the tabernacle. They are to take care of all the furnishings of the tent of meeting fulfilling the obligations of the Israelites by doing the work of the tabernacle. Give the Levites to Aaron and his sons. They are the Israelites who are to be given wholly to him. Appoint Aaron and his sons to serve as priests. Anyone else who approaches the sanctuary must be put to death. The Lord also said to Moses, I have taken the Levites from among the Israelites in place of the first male offspring of every Israelite woman. The Levites are mine, for all the firstborn are mine. When I struck down all the firstborn of Egypt, I set apart for myself every firstborn in Israel, whether man or animal. They are to be mine. I am the Lord. Now skip down to um, verse 45, chapter 3, verse 45. Take the Levites in place of all the firstborn of Israel and the livestock of the Levites in place of their livestock. The Levites are to be mine. I am the Lord. And now go to chapter 4 and we'll look at verse 15. Chapter 4, verse 15. After Aaron and his sons have finished covering the holy furnishings and all the holy articles, and when the camp is ready to move, the Kohathites are to come to do the carrying, but they must not touch the holy things, or they will die. The Kohathites are to carry those things that are in the tent of meeting. Eleazar, son of Aaron, the priest, is to have charge of the oil for the light, the fragrant incense, the regular grain offering, and the anointing oil. He is to be in charge of the entire tabernacle and everything in it, including its holy furnishings and articles. Here ends our reading this morning. There's a response of thankfulness we have printed for us in our bulletin. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks indeed. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we are thankful for this, your word. We pray that you would grow us in our wisdom, grow us in our knowledge of you through it this morning. Preach to us, Jesus, by this your word. Work by your spirit in us and among us that we would grow in our understanding of your great love for us in Christ. We pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Seems like just a couple of years ago, but it's been actually maybe eight years, something like that, ago, that uh, uh, Eli Manning, younger brother of Peyton Manning, uh, third son of Archie Manning. When I was a little boy, I had a, a junior football with Archie Manning's autograph on it, and I thought, quarterback for the Saints? <laughs> Why would you put that on football? But that's all I guess Franklin could afford. And so they put that on the football there. But uh, about eight years ago, uh, Eli Manning was being drafted into the NFL. He's a quarterback. Uh, he had gone to Mississippi, right? He had been under Coach Cutcliffe there, who's now at Duke. Um, and uh, he uh, made it known, as it was very apparent, he was going to be the first pick in the draft. 
and San Diego, the Chargers, had the first pick in the draft. He and his father, Archie, had made it known that he would not sign with San Diego. And so in advance, he declared that he would not sign with San Diego, even if he were drafted. And so he was pushing that even if he were drafted by San Diego, that San Diego would make a quick trade for him. And the reason he said this, the reason his dad said this, was they were not convinced that the management, the ownership, those in control of the organization, the San Diego Chargers, were all out committed to building a winning team. And so indeed, Eli was uh, drafted first, and immediately he was traded to the New York Giants. And that was one of the teams that he had said that he was willing to play for. And uh, his uh, dreams and hopes have, have come true, haven't they? Um, two Super Bowls uh, there he's had with the New York Giants, the latest one being just this past February now. Almost said January. You old folks know what I'm talking about. Um, and uh, he's very happy there. He feels like the organization above him has been committed to winning, committed to getting good players, good coaches, making the right decisions, all that kind of thing. This morning, as we look at this text, we also have uh, similar relief, maybe like Eli and his dad have had with the New York Giants, that God cares for us so much that he even puts over us people who are committed to, to us. So what are we talking about here? If you'd like to fill out blanks in an outline, you're welcome to do that. We'll begin now. If you don't want to fill out blanks, that's okay. You can just listen, but if that helps you, go ahead. First thing God says to us here, and he wants us to know by this passage today is this, that it is good news for you that the church has officers, elders and deacons. It is good news for you that the church has officers, elders, and deacons. Last week, and you can look it up online or, or, or ask me and I'll send you an outline or, or, or whatever you need. Last week we talked about how elders are equivalent of priests. Um, they're the ones who are kind of touching, so to speak, the, the holy things of God. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in, in a few minutes. And uh, deacons are the equivalent of the Levites. Um, they're the ones who are serving who are doing the things, the setup and the takedown and all that kind of thing. We'll talk about that in a little bit, uh, in, a little bit uh, in a few minutes from now as well. Uh, but these are officers that God had for his people, priests and Levites. You understand that the, um, Jacob, who was renamed Israel, had 12 sons, and uh, those were the 12 tribes of Israel. And then one son was named Levi, and from this tribe, Levi, Everybody went into ministry, essentially. And Aaron was a Levite. And Aaron and his descendants became this very specialized class of Levites, this specialized class of ministers. They were the priests. They were the ones who did the sacrifices and, and took the, the rams and the goats and that kind of thing and were dealing with the, the br special bread and the candles and uh, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, that kind of thing that was in the tabernacle and in the temple. But everybody else, all the other Levites who weren't descended from Aaron were just called simply the Levites. And they were tasked with, as you saw in chapter 4 here as we read that passage there, they were tasked with doing um, the, the set up to take down the service elements uh, of, of worship. So it's good news, first of all, we say just flat out, that you have officers here in the church. Why is that? Well, that's the rest. Number two, number two, note this, that officers are set apart. Officers are set apart. They're distinguished. They come out from, uh, from the rest of the Israelites set apart. And we see this in, in chapter 3, verses 5 through 11, as the Lord uh, speaks to the Levites. We see it in chapter 3, verse 13 as well. Um, we, we see there in verse 13, look there in your Bibles. He says, for all the firstborn uh, are mine. Um, when I struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, I set apart for myself every firstborn in Israel, whether man or animal, they are to be mine. I am the Lord. And then he says in verse 45, take the Levites in place of all the firstborn of Israel, 
And at the end of that verse, the Levites are to be mine. I am the Lord. So the Levites are, are, are set out to be holy, the Lord's, um, devoted to him, set apart. They're set apart in a couple of ways, and that's your A point here. They're set away, apart, first of all, to God. They're set apart to God. God makes his claim on them. He says, the Levites, they are, they are mine. These servants, these ministers of my worship in the tabernacle, they are mine. So they're set apart to God, and we see that in those verses there I've uh, uh, put down there for you. But they're also set apart for you. They're set apart for you. And we see this in verse 7 of chapter 3. Note there, and look down if you've got your Bible open or reopen it and look there. Chapter 3, verse 7. Speaking of the Levites. They are to perform duties for him and for the whole community at the tent of meeting by doing the work of the tabernacle. Their work, they were set apart for the whole community, for the sake of the whole community, that the whole community would be blessed. So officers are set apart to God, and they are set apart for you. Uh, Levites weren't allowed to, to farm. They were among all their brothers. All the other 12 tribes of Israel had, had land, and they were farming, and, and uh, they had inheritance of land. But the Levites, their inheritance was the Lord. And so they didn't have a plot of land. And if you look on a, a map of Old Testament Israel that gives you the 12 tribes, you'll notice there's no tribe of, tribe of Levi there. All the other tribes have land, but Levi doesn't. Their inheritance is the Lord himself, and they're not allowed to farm. Why? Because they're devoted to the worship of God. That's to be their full-time job. That's what they're doing. They're to be uh, freed from the, the cares of this life from farming their own food, from milking their own cows, so to speak, um, in order that they might be devoted so that God's people might worship. Okay, and that's your B point there. B, why are they devoted to God? Why are they devoted for you? So that God may be worshipped. So that God may be worshipped. And you see that for, there in verses 7 through 9, there to take care of, verse 8, there to take care of all the furnishings of the tent of meeting. Um, verse 7, there to perform duties for him, the whole community of the tent of meeting by doing the work of the tabernacle. These folks are set apart to God and for you so that God might be worshipped. Um, they're not set apart so that uh, um, uh, they can have special privileges. They're set apart so that God might be worshipped by the whole community. Um, now, why is this important? And why is this good for you that there are officers in the church who are set apart like we saw in Acts 6 when the elders, the apostles who have already been set apart then set apart these deacons there in Jerusalem, set apart from the congregation. Why is this good news? Um, well, it's good news because they're devoted um, that you might worship. And A, um, it's good news because worship is a gateway to you being blessed. Worship is a gateway to you being blessed. Um, so it's very important that there are officers in, in the church, that there are those taking care of worship. Um, when there was no worship going on in Old Testament times, when God's people in Old Testament times got astray in their worship, God's people experienced the discipline of God. And God withheld the rain from them so their crops didn't grow. He didn't give them an abundance in their produce. Foreign invaders came in and challenged them in their own land. They lost their homes. Some of their homes were burned. And then eventually in the Old Testament, we see that God's people are exiled. And what does God, and they're, they're pulled from their homes into a foreign land. And what does God name as the reason for their exile? Lack of worship. When God's people quit worshiping him, he sent prophets to them and said, you got to get your worship straight. You got to get this straight. Get all foreign gods out of here and statues to foreign gods and worship of foreign gods 
out of this land. This is holy land unto the Lord. And when God's people didn't repent, he sent them more prophets. And when they didn't repent, he sent them more prophets. And finally, he comes true on the worst of all covenantal curses given to them in Deuteronomy 27 and 28. He exiles them from the land. Worship is extremely important for us if we want to be blessed. If we want to be blessed by the Lord, worship, functioning, and proper is important for us. Worship is a gateway to us being blessed. And so be in your outline as they, the officers, do their work well, their work of worship happening, of worship being done in purity, as they do their work well, you get to be blessed. You know, Eli Manning would be the same kind of quarterback with the same set of skills, even if he were with a team where the management wasn't committed to uh, uh, working toward a Super Bowl championship team. He would still be the same person, but if he didn't have this organization above him, arranging things around him with coaches and players and the whole organization, he may not be a two-time Super Bowl champion. But God puts above us in the church officers who take care of all this stuff so that you can come and worship in purity and learn of God and learn who it is you're worshiping. And through that, you get blessed. The focus of our lives as we looked at, and I included just for this little point here today, as you look at the back of your bulletin, this was the arrangement of the camp of Israel. Um, that uh, the tabernacle was in the very, very center. And the tabernacle was probably, given the height of it, taller than all the other tents of all the 12 tribes that were around the tabernacle. And the point was very clear for God's people. God is in the center. God is the focus. And the worship of God, which is what was done in that tabernacle, that's what we're to be focused upon. When I come out of my, when I come out of my tent in the morning, I am to see that and remind myself and be reminded by that tabernacle that my primary duty in life, what I'm created for, is to give worship to God. And by that worship, I will be blessed. Okay, second thing, or third thing for you, number three. Um, so we have officers, and that's a good thing. And by the officers and their doing of worship stuff, we're blessed. Uh, deacons, first of all, number three. Deacons for you, A, enable worship to happen. Deacons enable worship to happen. They're like the Levites. They get everything set up properly. In its proper place, they carry it to the proper place. They make sure it doesn't get damaged. They put it in the proper place once they're settled as they were traveling around various places doing war. And they set up everything so that worship can be done by God's people. And deacons in the church enable worship to happen. We see this in verse 3 in chapter 8. Um, but in the church, deacons do set up, for instance. A deacon comes in here early every Sunday morning and sets everything up, gets everything going, the lights on, the things put in place. If there's a baptism, the deacon gets the baptism bowl out and puts some warm water. That's a little secret for you. Put some warm water in there so the little baby doesn't cry when, when uh, she or he gets baptized. Um, all, all the stuff, all the setup, and then all the takedown after it's all done. It's done by the deacons. This is Levitical work. It's work of service so that when we come in, we just get to worship. We walk in and everything's set up. And I don't have to worry about setting something up because it's already there. I can just focus upon the Lord. And that was the job of the Levites. Deacons take care of the building like the Levites did. Uh, deacons take care of the, the treasury. There's a treasurer we have among the deacons who pays our bills. B, second thing de deacons do for you, they serve the community of believers in the church. We see this a little bit in chapter 3, verse 7. Uh, we also see this in Acts chapter 6. Frank read that for us this morning. Uh, there were widows in the Jerusalem church who didn't have other means of support, and so the church, through their offerings to the poor, supported um, these widows and, and brought them meals. 
And so the deacons are set in charge of that task. They, they serve the community of believers in the church, deacons do. Now number four, elders. Uh, elders, second kind of officer in the church, elders. Uh, elders for you, A, perform, that's in quotes, it's not entertainment, but they're doing the work, they're doing the actual task. They perform the acts of worship. Elders for you perform the acts of worship and lead you in it. And we see this in the whole front first 16 verses of chapter 4. We didn't read all those verses, just the summary of those verses at the end of that. Uh, but elders lead in worship. Uh, in the Old Testament, uh, it was the priests. And they were doing the actual work of worship. They were taking the, the bull or the goat or the dove or whatever it was brought. And they were doing the sacrifice. And they were uh, given expertise in how to do that. What to do first, what to do second, what to do third. When the, when the believer who had come into the tabernacle was supposed to touch again the sacrifice. What happened and in what order? And what sacrifice was to be done when? What kind of worship was to be done when? When was new bread supposed to be put back on the table of the bread of presence? When, when were the sacrifices to be made? What kind of sacrifices were to be made? Who went into the very center of the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies, and when also God's people would be blessed? That was the work of the priests. They were actually doing the functional work of worship in the tabernacle and the temple uh, among God's people. And so that's what the elders do. And so elders today are, are your leaders in, in worship. Um, elders today determine what the worship service is. Um, the elders pick the passages. Pick the songs. Filter the songs so they're actually saying something that the Bible says is true. Sometimes songs that we have say something that's not um, scripturally accurate. Um, so we discard the song or change a word or something like that. Um, the elders do this. Elders lead us in prayer and call, call us to pray a, a, as a group. Um, elders uh, select and approve musicians, select and approve those who are teaching Sunday school and children's worship. Um, all these kind of things dealing with the worship of God, you learning of God and growing in your worship and understanding of him are things that the elders direct. Uh, they're, doing this, they're doing this work. Okay, So elders perform the acts of worship and lead you in it. Uh, secondly, B, the elders direct the church in a biblically informed, informed way. Elders are tasked with leading the church in a biblically informed way. We see this in 1 Timothy 5, 17, that elders direct the affairs of the church. Uh, we see this in Acts uh, chapter 6, as the apostles are the ones that, that direct the church and what they're supposed to do with this uh, feeding of the the widows there, they say you need to appoint elders, and, or sorry, they need, you need to appoint deacons, and then they're the ones that approve these deacons and ordain them to ministry there. They lay their hands upon them, pray over them, and ordain them to this task of being a deacon. And apostles Paul, or sorry, Peter the apostle, calls himself a, a fellow elder with the other elders of the church in his day. So there's a crossover in that that office. But elders direct the church in a biblically informed way. And this is blessing for you. That there are people who are biblically informed who are leading. What if a whole congregation took a vote on everything? Um, now, now maybe in our, with our American democratic sense of things we say, yeah, that's great. Democracy, you know. Everybody votes on everything. Until you think of the fact that, well, that would mean that a member who's been a Christian only a month has the same weight in their vote as a Christian who's been a Christian 60 years. Is that right? Um, should my nine-year-old daughter be president of the United States? Should she have a vote on the foreign, uh, our foreign relations committee? I don't want her to have a vote on the Foreign Relations Committee. She, she doesn't know enough. She's a smart girl. She doesn't know enough about foreign relations. She doesn't know the history of it, that kind of thing. I want people who know something about it to vote and to decide. And, and that's what we have 
in elders. You know, we, we don't want when LeBron and Dwayne come over during a timeout, they don't want the four-year-old telling them what to do and what impl- inbounds play to run in the next play. They want at least Eric Spolstra or maybe even better Phil Jackson telling them what to do on the next play. And that's what we have in the church, and that's what God gives to us. He gives us elders. And why the name elders? Because they're older in the Lord. They have maturity in the Lord. And God puts those with maturity in the Lord, whom you've recognized to have this maturity, whom you've voted upon as those who are mature in the Lord and capable of leading and informed and knowledgeable about the things of God and the things that are in Scripture. You've voted on these folks because you want to be led by those who know what they're talking about. I want my mechanic to have 17 years of experience, not one. So this is good news for us, that we are led in the church by those who are biblically informed or older in the Lord, more mature in the Lord. Okay, now five. Two responses from us. Two responses for us to have. First response is for officers, but I want all the rest of you to listen to this because it's important for you. Second response is for you members, and I want you officers to listen to this because it's important for you to hear. First of all, A, officers. Officers, your response to this, that you've been uh, uh, placed or set apart, is that you are to devote yourselves to the work. Devote yourselves to the work. Devote yourselves to the work, number one, having the purpose of your work always be that God would receive worship. Notice that the officers are put in in place here in this passage and here today in the church, they're put in place so that God might be properly worshipped, that he might be known, that he might be adored because he's known. And as he's adored, he's being worshipped. So always have in your work, whatever you're doing, whether you're setting up, whether you're taking down, whether you're writing checks for the church, whether you're uh, 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 leading or praying for the church, you officers, devote yourself to the Lord that the Lord might be, that he might receive worship. Have all your work in your mind as you're doing it. Center around, I'm doing this for the Lord, out of devotion for him. So, um, I'm embarrassed, Don. Don Don mows the grass for us. So, you know, you come by here, came by here yesterday afternoon, it looks great, you know? And you know why Don mows the grass? Because he's devoted to the Lord. That's it. And Don, you have that in your head when you mow the grass. This is for Jesus. Um, People come, why is that important? It's important. God has things orderly. When people come into this building, say we've got weeds all over the place and the grass is high, that kind of thing, a new person might come in and say, well, if that's how they're going to take care of my soul, I'm not coming back here. Um, things are, the, the work of service that deacons do is indicative of how we're going to take care of people's souls. Um, The the care that we put into a worship service and the teaching we do is is indicative of how much we care for people. So always have officers, uh, whenever you're doing your work, whatever the work is is that you're doing, no matter how mundane or how grandiose it is, do it out of devotion to Jesus. Second thing, um, do it out of honoring uh, devotion to God. I just gave that point. I get ahead of myself sometimes, but that's it. Out of honoring devotion to God. And when it's hard to do and when it's inconvenient to do, officers, remember this. By doing it, you're declaring by your action, God is worth it. I'm tired. I don't feel like doing this. This is out of my comfort zone, officers. You have those times where it feels like that, but God is worth it. Do it anyway, and you declare, even if nobody's seeing you, you declare to God up above, You declare to Satan and all his demons who can see you, who may be present, that there is someone here who is doing something that he would rather not be doing right now because he believes that God is that worthy. Number three. So we do it uh, with having in mind that God would receive worship by our work out of honoring devotion to God. And thirdly, officers, do it for the sake of God's people. 
Do it for the sake of God's people. Jesus' sheep, the ones for whom he died, need you, and they benefit from you to the degree that you give of yourself in serving in your office. We see in Scripture and in the church today that Jesus ministers to his people not just directly and immediately by his Spirit, but Jesus ministers to his people today immediately or indirectly or through the means of his officers. Um, Our church denomination has a book called the Book of Church Order, and we use it to order what we're doing according to Scripture. And it has a preface to it that I I love. And officers, you've heard this before, and you've heard me emphasize it. But everyone, I want you to hear this. This is the preface we have to uh, our, our Book of Order. Roman numeral one, the king and head of the church. Jesus the mediator, the sole priest, prophet, king, savior, and head of the church contains in himself, by way of eminency, all the offices in his church. Jesus is the deacon. Jesus is the elder. But he's not here on earth anymore. He went up to heaven and he gave his spirit to a a, a great number so that God's people could be ministered in to in real flesh and blood in their various locations by a real person endowed by God's Spirit, given certain gifts, ordained to these offices so that God's people might be blessed. Jesus ministers to his church, being the chief deacon and elder himself through fallen men whom he's ordained to office and through whom he nonetheless works greatly by his spirit. So officers, do your job well, work hard, that worship would happen well, and that God's people would be blessed. Okay, now members, realize this. Jesus has a lot of individuals whom he's put through a lot a lot of life experiences, a lot of time in the church. If they're in this church and an officer in the church, six months, two hours every Sunday mor- or every uh, Saturday morning at 7 a.m. Six months of this, just so they can be qualified to take an exam so they can be, go before the session of the church to be determined if they're even eligible to be voted upon by the church to be a deacon or elder in the church. So realize that Jesus has a lot of individuals, officers in the church, going through a lot of trouble and effort and preparation so that you are doing well spiritually. So that you are maximally experiencing God's blessing. So that you, when you come to worship, are not experiencing something just done that off the cuff without much thought. But that you're experiencing something to which a whole lot of man hours have gone into for this one period of worship on Sunday morning, week after week. So realize that a lot of, a lot of meetings, a lot of responsibilities, a lot of thoughts, and a lot of prayers have gone into the officer's work so that you might benefit. So when you arrive each week, Jesus has seen to it, to it that through the work of, of elders preparing the service, that you'll be blessed by it. And when you arrive each week, Jesus has seen to it that through the work of deacons, everything is set so that you won't be distracted by things that aren't organized already when you arrive. And all this work goes together by order of Jesus so that you are blessed by the worship service, so that you, by worshiping, are blessed So number one, number one, members, rejoice, rejoice at the depth of Jesus' care for you in giving you officers in the church. He didn't just save you and leave all things to happenstance. But Jesus has been very intentional for your sake. And he said to certain men, elders, I hold you accountable for directing the affairs of the church and you will have to give an account to me, for the souls who are under you. Jesus has done that for you. 
And Jesus has provided for you deacons to serve the worship of God, to serve you in the church, and he will hold them accountable to the service that they've done in the church. Jesus has done that because he cares for you, one of his sheep. So rejoice at the depth of Jesus' care for you and giving you officers in the church. And then, and this is true for our treatment of parents, our treatment of those who are over you in any fashion, whether it's a, a doctor or a dentist or uh, the, the person doing checkout for you at Walmart or the person stocking shelves for you in the store or the plumber who comes to your house and fixes your plumbing, right, Frank? Um, <laughs> realize that a lot of stuff has gone in to them helping you. And so we as people need to understand this and be generally, um, as the, the first place we come from, grateful, thankful to the people around us, to the people who are over us, to the people who are working hard for us, to the people who have gone through training so that we might benefit in some way. But in the church specifically, and this is your number two, set apart officers in your own heart. Um, give them special honor because of the work they do. And, and this is what Frank read for us in 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 13. Um, honor those and love those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord. Or, or uh, another place there, I've listed it for you that, yeah, there, uh, 1 Timothy 5, 17, that um, those who rule well are worthy of double honor. Wow, they're doing a lot of work for you, and they're doing Jesus' work so that you are well taken, well taken care of so that you are doing well spiritually. So this is God's lesson for us this morning. Um, God cares for you in many ways. And one of the ways he cares for you is by giving you officers in the church. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we are thankful that you love us, that you care for us. You cared for us by giving us the, the chief elder and the chief deacon upon this earth, um, who was a priest for us and who bore our sins in his body on the cross, who became, as Frank read for us this morning in our declaration of the gospel, he became a sacrifice, a once-for-all sacrifice for our sins so that there is no longer any sacrifice for our sins that is needed. Thank you for caring, uh, caring for us through him. Thank you, Jesus, for caring for us by giving us real flesh and blood, real human being, real living in Clayton or wherever we live, officers in the church so that we are taken care of and so that our souls are doing well. Cause our officers to do this with great devotion and effort and hard work and cause all our members to interact with them with great appreciation for the work they've done to them, but appreciation to you, Jesus, for providing them, those who are organizing and setting all things in place so that we can succeed, so to speak, in reflecting you well in this world. We pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen.